first session, our last uh, formal talk for the conference. Hello to my brother Jesuit, Father Peter Beer. Here, here. Bless you. Thank you. Um, delight to introduce Professor Matthew Ogilvy, um, even though he's from uh, Notre Dame University in Perth. Um, and he's got this huge topic to uh, address where is Honigan located in Catholic theology? Um, you probably know much about. Uh, Matthew's professional background. I notice the Notre Dame website does not have your latest book listed under your CV yet. You might want to get that corrected, but uh, Peter's late, um, Matthew's latest book is available there for $20. Um, feel free to grab that. A um, couple of interesting things, apart from all the academic stuff about Matthew. Um, he belongs to one of his professional affiliations is the Heterodox Academy. Um, yeah, you're on the Heterodox Academy, according to your website. So that will um, delight some of us and probably concern some of us um, <laughs> as to what we're going to be getting in this talk. And he um, is a self-defense instructor in Krav Maga, Krav, what is it called? Krav Maga, Israeli martial arts, and also a venomous snake catcher. Um, in WA. It's not clear whether that's... Um, is it snakes that are venomous? That's right. Is it a, cat <laughs> a catcher of venomous snakes or a venomous catcher of snakes? <laughs> is not clear. Um, and does that come together with the self-defense stuff? You use crowd Margaret to catch the, and, and the snakes? And theology all, all of And theology all together. So, I give you Matthew. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a lot of explaining to do, I suppose. Uh, first, it's traditional to um, acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land and the country on, on which I, I work in Perth, the Wajak people, and in Broome, the Bardi, and Yaru. And also to acknowledge, uh, I'm hoping you're there, Peter, uh, Peter Beer and John Beer for their constant support, uh, material, spiritual, and uh, otherwise, and, and encouragement. Um, how do all my professional activities and others come together um, the Heterodox Academy, just, I, I don't think I need to justify that too much. Um, it's a group of scholars who are dedicated not to heterodoxy as such, but to free speech. Um, and that's something I believe in quite firmly and which is under attack in contemporary universities. So I, I joined this group and a couple of our more um, enthusiastic Catholics have seen that and assumed that it meant something that they've always suspected. But it's, it's not that I'm a <laughs> raving heretic or anything, just I, I do believe in uh, free speech in the academy. Um, the self-defence and that sort of thing and, and snake catching, um, yeah, you know, I live in Western Australia, what do you expect? Um, <laughs> we do actually live close to Herdsman Lake, which has got the second highest concentration of venomous snakes or of tiger snakes anywhere in the world. Uh, except for Karnak Island, which is just off the coast of WA. So, how that all comes together is in two ways. Um, a, a very anxious Catholic wanted to know what's dealing with venom snakes has to do with theology, and I said, well, look, in Genesis chapter 3 and 4, <laughs> if I was there, um, you would catch the snake. I was. Although I've got to confess, um, I, I had Vietnamese students, and they said this, not me. I've got, I've got to clarify. One of them, who's, who's being ordained later this month, said, oh, of course, yeah, because the, the Vietnamese are always just so respectful. They said, oh, with all respect, Professor, no need to worry. If Adam and Eve were Vietnamese, they would leave the apple and eat the snake. <laughs> My journey, um, it's actually interesting because when I was um, intellectually converted in uh, Peter Beer's TH214, the Living God Trinity course at Catholic Theological Union, I was um, exposed to the idea that we, we could rely on what is the reality of human knowing rather than what knowing is meant to be and that's intellectual conversion. Um, not having predetermined ideas of what knowing is, but actually doing real knowing in reality. 
And my, my journey into self-defense um, was interesting because there are a lot of martial arts, and I have respect for all of them, which are based on repressing reality and creating um, a world that doesn't really exist. Uh, whereas the, the uh, Israeli, the, the Jewish method is, yeah, you've got to deal with things as they really exist. Understanding yourself as a person who really exists and a, a threat which really exists. And of course, with the snake handling, there is no, no room there for pussyfooting around with an idealistic notion of this is how snakes are supposed to be. You deal with them with experienced understanding and judgment <laughs> in the real world. Uh, the other thing, of course, um, when I'm introduced to students, and, and I, I, I don't know if I mentioned this at the last workshop, but it's a good story that has the advantage of being true. My very first call out, um, I was dressed in my Steve Irwin type stuff, getting a tiger snake out of a very um, tight spot. And this girl goes, are you at Notre Dame? I said, oh yeah, how do you know? I said, did you teach introduction to theology two years ago? I said, I did. And she said, I was in your class. You're my, you're my lecturer and I couldn't help myself. I'm picking this deadly damn animal. And, and I said, well, you know how at Notre Dame we say you're a name, not a number, and we pastorally care for our students? I said, you won't get any lecture from UWA who's going to do this for you. <laughs> um, so, to Lonigan. Yeah, I mean, look, the University of Divinity do... No. Um, I want to say something about Lonigan's objectives for theology and his relationship to different theologians or um, theological movements. And I have to confess, I'm not going to say anything in, in great theological depth this morning, so in the light of Kathleen's <coughs> presentation, please forgive me. But when I started writing this presentation, I realised I'd bitten off more than I can chew and that I probably said yes not to a one-hour presentation but to writing a second doctoral thesis. So what I'm going to do today is just, just throw out some short reflections. Say a little bit about Lonigan, say a little bit about different theologians or movements, and instead of presenting deep insights to, to prompt us to follow our own questions and, and interests. Where this comes from is, is that when I was teaching at Dallas um, some time ago now, um, I wrote, uh, sorry, I didn't write, I, I taught a course uh, called Comparative Theologies. And that, that was in response to a lot of students who said, you know, tell us about this Rana guy, Hans Kuhn, and, and a few students just, you know, explain these heretics to us. Because, you know, it's, it's Texas, so there's lots and lots of heretics. Um, so what I did was something subversive. I, I, I went up to my boss and I said, you know, all the students wanted, wanted this. And he said, oh, if they want it, it's a good idea. Um, go teach them. Um, so what I did was I used the, the book by Neil Ormerod. I don't know if you're familiar with Introducing Contemporary Theologies. It's actually, it's, it's a great introduction, not just to Lonigan. Because Neil's quite clever there. He said it's all about contemporary theologians, but it's really all about Lonigan and how um, Lonigan, uh, Lonigan perspective helps you to understand these other folks. Um, I found him very useful um, on understanding diff different theologies. Um, and look, if anyone's in interested, I'd say read Neil's book, and if you want more course notes, email me and I'll, I'll, I'll let you have them. Um, but what we do is we, we, we begin with Bernard Lonigan and Lonigan gave the students the foundation they needed to appropriate their own um, knowing, their own knowing process, their own cognitional structure, and then to appropriate themselves as theological thinkers. And then to do something that's challenging, and I guess this is the spirit of what I want to do today, um, to ask what is good about other theologians and movements, as well as what's bad. And the reason for that is, look, it's, it's easy to say other theologians are bad. I mean, that, that is um, something that human beings are very good at. We like to say, oh, you know, I don't like X, Y, Z because of A, B, C. But what good can you say about the other? 
And you know, I, 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 I'd ask and it was challenging, you know, sometimes getting Texans to say something good about different movements. Um, you know, I, I get these super conservative Texan Catholics to answer the question, what is good about feminist theology? Okay. Um, and then, you know, and we, we did have uh, left-wing liberals in Texas. Um, yeah, all three of them. Um, <laughs> sorry, there were actually four. Um, but I'd ask them to say, you know, what's, what's good about the theology of, of, of Cardinal Ratzinger, for example? And so this is why I believe in academic freedom, because in Australia, I wouldn't be allowed to set an assignment like that. It'd be too triggering. Um, but this is where I find the value of Bernard Lonigan is that he gives you a place to stand and gives you a set of tools. Or should I rephrase that? He helps you discover within yourself the set of tools that allow you not just to say, I disagree with whomever, either because the Pope says so or because they wrote something you disagree with them, but to help you understand what's going on in the other. And I'm, I'm talking personally here. This is how I found that... Um, in my own journey, I found Bernard Lonigan helps me see the good in others, not just theologians, um, but with the, the, the work that I've done with Aboriginal people in Western Australia, who, um, you know, I've got to confess, every time I would meet with the folks up in the Kimberley, I'd preface it until they told me to shut up. I'd, I'd sit down with uh, people like Patrick Dodson and, and other leaders up there and say, listen, I'm just a dumb white guy, so I apologise for what I'm about to say. Um, until some of them started saying, when I sit down, they'd say, look, we forgive you already, you know, get on with it. <laughs> um, but what I found was that, um, from a Lonigan perspective, I found it very, not easy, but straightforward to understand Aboriginal spirituality, law, concepts of land and, and, and morality. And how did this happen? Well, as we know, Lonigan pursued and developed a method that was, it was transcultural. Um, and beyond multiculturalism, now, I mean, this is where I think, you know, someone's triggered another thesis or something. There's, there's a crude form of multiculturalism that we have today, which means we, we embrace everyone but understand nothing, okay? Um, which, which leads to this melting pot of people who've got no idea of who or what the other is and what they think, feel, and, and, and what their values are. But Lonigan wasn't um, crude, he's transcultural. He gave us um, a theology that was methodical, up to the standards of modern science, and importantly based on human beings as they are, not as we would want them to be. And for me, the most important thing he did was to follow the example of Aquinas in using the tools of contemporary thought to present authentic Christian teaching. Now, th th this is something that, um, and this is where I mix up my, my other interest, which is in religious extremism, which has led me into um, an understanding of Islam. And you know, just to clarify that, um, how do I put the point very quickly? As we'd all know, so please don't get me wrong, the crushing majority of Muslims are not extremists. I mean, we know this, but sometimes people take me the wrong way. But I, when, when someone did take me the wrong way, but from the other perspective, they say, oh, you know, there's nothing good about Islam, it's terrible, and what have they ever given us? And I, I yeah. And I said, well... I want you to start thinking about stuff. And they say, oh, you know, Al-Qaeda and all this. I say, yeah, okay, that was a pretty bad thing. But what about algebra, algorithms? And, of course, I've got to be careful because I mentioned that to my kids once. You know, the Arabs gave us algebra. And, yeah. Yeah, that wasn't right. But Thomas Aquinas, back in the day, after he died, he was condemned uh, by an Archbishop John Peckham, I don't know if you're, you're aware of that, who, who roasted these Dominicans, which were basically a new religious movement at the time, and their introduction, their invasion of pagan dogmas because they engaged 
the Arabs. Now, the reality is, if I mention John Peckham, most of us are going, well, who is John Peckham? Exactly. Well, what Thomas did was not just say, hey, we've got the Bible, we've got Augustine, Let, let's, let's just take authorities and that sort of thing. But he took the best of modern learning at the time, and we, we, we kind of forget that nowadays. Like we're, we're used to uh, weeping tears over scholasticism and that sort of thing. But remember, back in the day, to mystic method, Aristotelian philosophy was the very best learning of the time. And it was radical and it was new. Partly because the people who'd kept Aristotle alive were the Arabs. Who, as my Arabic friends keep reminding me, we were light years ahead of you at the time. And they were. And so what Thomas did was he, he wasn't afraid of the new learning. But he, he embraced it, he learnt it, took on the best of Jewish and Arab thought at the time and expressed the Christian faith, Christian doctrine in terms that were credible, reliable and intelligible in the best ways of the time. And that's what Lonigan did. He embraced the best of contemporary learning, integrated that with the old, or as Leo XIII would say, he augmented the old with the new to give us a higher perspective for our, our own days. So he fostered a theology through his method that was transcultural and specialised. And that's another thing that's, that's very important about his specialisation, is that it resolved a number of issues that, that we do have today. But I'll talk a bit more about the transcultural part of Lonigan. Where did he find that? Not in a crude sort of politically correct multiculturalism, but he became transcultural by discovering the invariant <coughs> operations of the human mind. This is the thing that um, is invariant. We all have minds and use them. Remember what Lonigan said, theologians have had minds, they have minds and they always use them. So other people, be they different Christian theologians, be they non-Catholic, be they your everyday person in the street in Baghdad, have the same human mind and they use them. And it's through the invariant operations of those minds that we can un understand the others. By basing his method on the operations of intellect, he advanced the specialisation of, of, of theology. And this is actually a crisis we have in the contemporary academy. Um, we, we've spoken at this workshop about the silos that the different disciplines find their way into and the, the compartmentalisation that, that John Paul II lamented in, in his Ex Corde Ecclesiae, his, his manifesto, if you like, for Catholic universities. But by identifying what it is that when we do theology, in fact, with his transcendental method, his general empirical method, Lonigan identified the way that we can specialise, but to do so in a way which is integrated and that each discipline can relate with each other rather than talk at each other. Lonigan's theology, and, and this is the first of the others I'll deal with, his aims and what he achieved, in my opinion, echoes what Newman did in his time. Newman, um, and it, it, it's, it's funny, I, I gave a presentation to the, um, the ordinariate community over in Perth. Um, that's, they hate me calling them the Anglican ordinariate, so, but I think I'm fairly safe here. Um, but I... <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Steve. Um, but, yes, you know, Kathleen would say... Let the forgiveness flow. <laughs> but I, 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 they asked me would I give a talk on Newman, and, and I, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that as so long as I can say what I want. And they sort of drew their breath in and like, think, well, we're going to regret this. Um, but I called, I called the talk Newman the Orthodox Liberal. Because, you know, nowadays with the advantage of hindsight, you know, everyone's saying Newman was great, he was wonderful, and that sort of thing. But people forget how radical Newman was in his day. And that he was not what we, uh, what, what 
some people call liberal with a, you know, the sort of almost spit nowadays. But someone who's a liberal in the, in the sense of being open and wanting to advance what we have. What Newman wanted to do, like Lonigan, was to remain within the traditions of his church, but at the same time make genuine use of the available tools of modern scholarship. So if I can quote Newman from the development of Christian doctrine, he said, Christianity has been long enough in the world to justify us in dealing with it as a fact of the world's history. In other words, we can't escape being part of the world's history, and so we can't understand Christianity without using the tools of history. That's the positive side of Newman. The negative is, and I'll quote, the assailants of dogmatic truth have got the start of its adherence of whatever creed. I mean, look, Newman's language is just wonderful. What he said was that Christianity has not yet um, adapted the modern scholarship that was being used to great effect by Christianity's enemies. We, we just hadn't got a handle. I mean, Catholics were very good at repressing. Oh, we're wonderful at that. But Newman said, look, if people are using modern history and modern philosophy against us, we, we can either build ourselves into fortress Catholic, or we can take on those tools, or those you know, weapons, as he called them, and use them ourselves. And in that way, Lonigan and Newman have a great affinity. Lonigan held that theologians cannot escape using their minds. We may want to disagree with that, but um, we, we shouldn't. We, we use our minds. So a theological method couldn't be properly discovered and used without understanding the human mind's operations and meeting the highest standards of contemporary scholarship. So in that way, Newman and Lonigan, I, I think if I, if I had to nominate theologians that were the closest to Newman, um, certainly Aquinas, but in the more or less modern world, Newman. Funny things were, the funny thing was that I dug up some correlations or similarities between uh, Lonigan and um, John Paul II and Joseph Ratzinger. Like Lonigan, um, well, to you, John Paul II, now it depends on when you're looking at him, um, but John Paul II agreed that humans have a basic orientation to truth, but that many contemporary problems are caused by a retreat from truth. The solution to many problems that, that John Paul pointed out in Fides et Ratio comes from restoring our courage to seek truth, to have faith not only in God, and I think this is something that um, may not be said as explicitly as we might like, but is there constantly in Lonigan. And Lonigan has this in common with John Paul too, <coughs> that we have to have faith in God, but also faith in ourselves. Um, and, and this is the, you know, what happened with the foundation of, of universities way back in the day, was when we started to have faith in our ability to know truth, to be responsible, to know God for ourselves. And yet, sometimes in, 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 in some trends in, in society, in the academy, people have lost that confidence in ourselves. And um, when I put my head up over the parapet of the contem contemporary academy, and I say, what's wrong with it? I say, look, what we need is the bold commitment to truth that, that Lonigan and, and John Paul had, and to have faith in our ability to know what is real. The quest for truth, of course, is not just objective, and um, in, in our group before we were discussing Lonigan's quote that objectivity is the fruit of authentic subjectivity. And that, I, I was actually surprised to learn this, ha has an affinity with... Um, the thought of, <coughs> of uh, Joseph Ratzinger, later Pope Benedict. Humanity, according to Ratzinger, and I'll quote him here, must seek a breakthrough to what is really true. A person must ask who they really are, what they are to do. One must ask whether there is a God, who God is, and what the world is. In other words, translating Ratzinger or Benedict into Lonigan terms, one must be intellectually converted, morally and religiously converted. 
I'd also noted uh, John Paul's criticism of the compartmentalization or atomization of our knowledge. And in Ex Corde Ecclesiae, he outlines a vision for uniting different disciplines under the mantle of philosophical and theological wisdom. The question is how you do that. And I think if we relate John Paul's vision to Lonigan, Lonigan would argue, and, and the context for this was um, for a number of years I was in administration. And we were talking at Notre Dame about how we can um, integrate the Catholic intellectual tradition into everything that we do. And one of the, uh, my colleagues from another campus, I won't say which one it was, um, that this is a video conference, said, well, how can we integrate the Catholic intellectual tradition into mathematics? And I, I made the mistake of answering the question. Um, <laughs> I spoke about how the Catholic intellectual tradition just gave birth to modern science, math, philosophy and history and all that sort of thing. Um, but I think one of the ways in which Lonigan can specifically help is by taking on John Paul's vision that we need to have a philosophical and theological integration of the different disciplines. But Lonigan... Um, gets us beyond the, the, the current sort of interdisciplinary um, subjects that we have. Now, those of us who have been in the academy would know that in, in the 80s and 90s, universities started realising that it's all going horribly wrong. The lawyers can't understand the doctors, the physicists can't understand the biologists, no one can understand the theologians, and the philosophers can't understand each other. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to remember their names. Like at the University of Sydney, we had two different schools of philosophy. Frame and, um, Traditional and, and modern? Yeah. And classic and contemporary? Yeah. Or as those of us not from that school said, the Judean People's Liberation Front <laughs> and the People's Front for the Liberation of Judea. Yeah. Um, idea, but what we were doing was, was subject and field specialisation with the result being that one school of interdisciplinary studies could not understand another school of interdisciplinary studies. Because these things, now I know like, where, where's John? John's thing was right. It worked, but so many people in the academy couldn't get it. What they couldn't get was functional specialisation. Where you've got people who are doing different tasks, if you like, in the process from data to results, which provide more data in a method which is a recurring uh, and recurrent operation that leads to that process that takes on the past and also hands on to the future. Looking at uh, other theologians, uh, Hans Kung, he's, he's a fav favourite of mine in a way. Um, Lonigan's approach to history and tradition actually distinguishes him significantly from Kung. Now, what unites them is that both of them have got serious concerns about engaging the concerns of contemporary culture. And to that extent, there, there's an affinity. I mean, usually don't mention Kung and Lonigan in the same sentence, but, but I am. But the problem is that both of them are, are, are concerned with the present. But Lonigan has a greater concern for tradition than Kung. For Kung... Um, Jesus, for example, isn't to be found in tradition, but in what he calls critical history. And I think going, going beyond the surface, I mean, traditional Catholics um, like to point out that, that Kuhn has no respect for tradition. I'm not quite sure that's, that's the, the exact issue with Kuhn, and we, we can have a big debate about that. But more accurately, if we use Lonigan's theological method to understand what Kung is doing when he's doing theology. I mean, Hans, he's brilliant. Uh, I mean, he's Swiss, so he says everything the way, way that he does. But instead of saying he has no respect for tradition, I think, and this is just my opinion, we find Kung's theology operating mostly in the second phase of theology, from doctrines to, to communications. So rather than ignoring tradition, I think if, if Kung was aware of Lonigan's method, which begins with research, interpretation, history, 
and dialectic, then that's the, 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 the real difference, if you like. That Lonergan's operating in both phases, whereas Kuhn is only operating in one. I'll return to Ratzinger uh, because I, I just love mentioning Kung and Ratzinger in the same sentence. Um, Ratzinger and Lonergan are united in upholding a strong relationship between theology and philosophy. Now that unfortunately doesn't characterise a lot of contemporary theology. Uh, the best example of that we see in Lonergan's response to Schoenenberg in um, the third collection, Christology Today. Um, and this beautiful quote from Lonergan, contemporary Catholic theology deprecates any intrusion from philosophy. The result inevitably is not no philosophy, but unconscious philosophy and only too easily bad philosophy. And it's that emphasis on, on good philosophy um, that unites Lonergan, Lonergan, Ratzinger and John Paul II. The funny, well, What's interesting, though, and what separates them is that Ratzinger is highly sceptical of the historical process of understanding. Now, it's fair enough that he rejects truth which is absolutely relativised. So Ratzinger would, would be pitted against postmodernism, for example. But, and, and look, there are reasons why Ratzinger is sceptical of history and that sort of thing. But against his harsh um, ahistorical position, Lonergan's helpful by telling people like Ratzinger that truth and theological facts don't change, but humans change, so that their understanding of these truths change. So it's not that if he's around today, Lonergan wouldn't say Ratzinger's absolutely wrong, but if he could embrace a critical historical method, then that would advance exactly what he's trying to say. From Ratzinger to um, his, his master, and um, I, I always like to point out to Rana fans and Ratzinger fans that uh, during the Second Vatican Council, um, Karl Rana, because he's a Paredes there, he did a number of things, but one of them was he introduced his most brilliant student, a young father, Joseph Ratzinger. Now, if you want to start a fight in theology, um, <laughs> Get some Ratzinger fans and some Rana fans and just see what happens. Uh, the Rana people say, oh, no, we completely disown him. And the Ratzinger fans, well, he wasn't totally corrupted by Rana. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get them to turn on me by saying, actually, I'm a Lonigan scholar. <laughs> but Rana, um, he and Lonigan have common roots in, in Marshall. And I'll, I'll just throw that out as something which I, I, I think is underappreciated. Um, but they, they differed in the, the ways that they used Marshall. They were united in adopting a transcendental method um, that was transcendental in the sense of interpreting the conditions under which knowing was done. In other words, both of them, I think, inherited from Marshall the question, what are we doing when we know? Lonigan and Rana share a common term to the human subject, but I would argue that Rana's turn is perhaps more radical than Lonergan's. And we see this in, in Rana's turn away from uh, the traditional theocentric approach in, to, in theology to what's been called an anthropocentric approach. So instead of beginning with the question, what is God and how do humans fit into God's plan, Rana begins with, what is the human condition? What are human questions? And how does God answer those questions? Or how is God relevant to the human condition? Now, I'm going to throw out a value judgment here, and I'm, I'm willing to be um, criticised for it. Um, but I think sometimes Rana is too focused on the human person. Um, everything begins with the human person. Now, the advantage of that, the beauty of it is, it begins with our concerns. But just sometimes when I read Rana, I think... There's too much of the human and the subject and not enough of the object in God. And that's why I think Lonigan's method, which is authentically subjective, is also better um, at being authentically subjective because Lonigan's subjectivity is always mindful of the theologian's object, which is not just human beings, 
but God. The way I put it with um, a Rana scholar that I was um, having a good conversation with was that um, Lonigan, in a way, and I said this the wrong way, I said Lonigan is kind of bipolar, um, and the Rana fans all agreed with that immediately. I said, that's not what I mean. I mean that instead of operating at the one pole of the human person or the one pole of God, that Lonigan can operate with both at the same time because of his method. That's what his method allowed. That's what his emphasis on, on conversion allowed. And so, um, you know, I, I'd never commit this to writing, but I said, look, what I think can really help you Rana guys is an appreciation of Lonigan, his method and conversion. And, and that's when things got very exciting. <coughs> I want to end with the hermeneutics of suspicion. And, you know, the hermeneutics of suspicion run through... Um, various forms of liberation theology, be they um, race theology. Um, and if you ever, I mean, I, I, I came late to that party, but you know, reading some of the black theology of the 1960s is very, very interesting uh, to tell you the way that theology was going at the time. There's feminist um, theology and Latin American political liberation theologies. Now, this hermeneutic of suspicion we see strongly. Um, in the liberation theology of Juan Segunda and the feminist theologies of Schussler Shush, uh, Fiorenza and Elizabeth Johnson. Now, I think that um, Lonigan would have a sympathy for theologies that critique ideological language. And I, I think this has been one of the really good things that these, these different hermeneutic of suspicion movements have done, is to say, look, you know, sometimes the language is ideologically loaded. And we need to question that and, and critique it. But one of the problems with, with this hermeneutic of suspicion and a number of um, identity movements or issues theologies is that they are very, very good at tearing down ideologies and structures of sin. But the question is, what replaces those, those ideologies? And my experience is that Lonigan is very amenable to what we call a hermeneutic of recovery. And I, I was introduced to that, that, that term by Hugo Menel um, almost 11 years ago. Um, and when I thought about that, I realised that what, what Lonigan does with his method is, is to give us the tools with which we can go beyond deconstruction to reconstruction and to um, advance different theologies to their higher potential. In other words, what Lonigan can do through a theology which is contemporary and traditional at the same time, a theology which um, relies on the invariant operations of the human mind, a theology which is uh, methodical and um, relies on conversion, is that Lonigan can not destroy, but fulfil, to plagiarise a phrase. I think that he can do this because Lonigan's method is not tied to, as he calls it, the temporal situation or context. That is, as he said in his doctoral dissertation, he achieved, at the time he's working towards it, of course, Lonigan has a vantage point outside the temporal dialectic. He achieved a matrix or system of thought that at once is as pertinent and as indifferent to historical events as is the science of mathematics to quantitative phenomena. In other words, a method which can be involved intensely while remaining sufficiently outside <coughs> to be able to be self-critical. So certainly Lonigan has interests in contemporary concerns. But his interests go beyond that. And that's partly due to the nature of his method as a normative pattern of recurrent and related operations yielding cumulative and progressive results. In other words, Lonigan takes into account the present, but he also takes on the past and hands on to the future. And this is what I've said to a few folks from, from different theological movements. Um, you know, because... I, I, I guess and now I'm going to sound like an old guy and my kids will tell you that's the case. Uh, you know, back in the 80s when I was doing theology, 
um, it was all liberation theology. That was the theological orthodoxy of the time. Um, and we've been through feminist theology and eco-theology, uh, postmodern theology and, and, and these things which have great, wonderful insights. But when I feel courageous, actually when I feel, well, when I'm foolish, but I'm calling it courage, I'll ask some of my friends in these fields, you're speaking so well to the present. What about the future? And, you know, I, I, I've got a very good friend in, in, in liberation theology that I once said to, what are you going to do when all the dictators have gone? And, and, that, and his, his response was great. He said, there will always be t dictators. There will always be the struggle. But the point is, Lonigan not only speaks to the past and the present, but also the future, which I think is his great strength. In other words... He's genuinely contemporary while being thoroughly traditional. So where is Lonigan situated or where is he located in contemporary theology? Now, it could be deliberately, cowardly and evasive and ask, which Catholic theology? Um, we have a remarkable variety of Catholic theologies today. Some complement one, one another. Others see theologians accused of heresy, or, as we saw last week, um, <coughs> theologians accusing the Pope of heresy. Um, yeah, that was fun. Uh, where is Lonigan really? Well, certainly not accusing the Pope of heresy. But where he is, um, the best answer comes from Lonigan himself. And not something that he wrote and predicted, but I, I, I'm more and more saying that he prophesied the future of theology. In Dimensions of Meaning, in, in the first collection, he foresaw the formation of different parties within Catholicism. There were those who'd hold on to the classicist framework, standing firm against the ravages of the modern world. Those aren't his words, but mine. While there'd be another party that would form in an attempt to embrace modernity, but lacked adequate methodological formations. And so he wrote this. Classical culture cannot be jettisoned without being replaced. And what replaces it cannot but run counter to classical expectations. There is bound to be formed a solid right that is determined to live in a world that no longer exists. Now, I would add to that, these are not my words, not Lonigan's. I'd say a solid right determined to live in a world that never existed. Lonergan continues, there's bound to be formed a scattered left, captivated by now this, now that new development, exploring now this and now that new possibility. And I, I, I think, and maybe we can debate this, <coughs> he predicted the state of Catholicism today. You know, we've got the solid right who, who want to live in a world that either no longer exists or never did. And then the scattered left to, on you know, this trend, this flavour of the month and, and, and this new issue. But what would Lonigan want us to do? What Will County says is perhaps a not too numerous centre, big enough to be at home in both the old and the new, painstaking enough to work out one by one the transitions to be made, strong enough to refuse half measures and insist on complete solutions even though it has to wait. So where is Lonigan located? It's there at the not too numerous centre. Neither right nor left. Neither blindly following tradition nor naively embracing contemporary trends. But faithful to tradition and concerned with the modern world. Neither committed to faith nor reason alone but committed to reason guided by faith. He's committed to upholding the standards of modern science and scholarship, but not beholden to them because he understood the universality of human consciousness. So where is Lonigan? Neither left nor right, neither high nor low, but firmly in all ways, in my opinion, at the centre. Thank you. idea, but what we were doing was, was subject and field specialisation. 
with the result being that one school of interdisciplinary studies could not understand another school of interdisciplinary studies. Because these things, now I know like, where, where's John? John's thing was right. It worked. But so many people in the academy couldn't get it. What they couldn't get was functional specialisation. Where you've got people who are doing different tasks, if you like, in the process from data to results, which provide more data in a method which is a recurring uh, and recurrent operation that leads to that process that takes on the past and also hands on to the future. Looking at uh, other theologians, uh, Hans Kung, he's, he's a fav favourite of mine in a way. Um, Lonergan's approach to history and tradition actually distinguishes him significantly from Kuhn. Now, what unites them is that both of them have got serious concerns about engaging the concerns of contemporary culture. And to that extent, there, there's an affinity. I mean, usually don't mention Kuhn and Lonergan in the same sentence, but, but I am. But the problem is that both of them are, are, are concerned with the present. But Lonergan has a greater concern for tradition than Kuhn. For Kuhn, um, Jesus, for example, isn't to be found in tradition, but in what he calls critical history. And I think going, going beyond the surface, I mean, traditional Catholics um, like to point out that, that Kuhn has no respect for tradition. I'm not quite sure that's, that's the exact issue with Kuhn, and we, we can have a big debate about that. But more accurately, if we use Lonergan's theological method to understand what Kuhn is doing when he's doing theology, I mean, Hans, he's brilliant. Uh, I mean, he's Swiss, so he says everything the way, way that he does. But instead of saying he has no respect for tradition, I think, and this is just my opinion, we find Kuhn's theology operating mostly in the second phase of theology, from doctrines to, to communications. So rather than ignoring tradition, I think if, if Kuhn was aware of Lonergan's method, which begins with research, interpretation, history, and dialectic, then that's the, 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 the real difference, if you like. That Lonergan's operating in both phases, whereas Kuhn is only operating in one. I'll return to Ratzinger uh, because I, I just love mentioning Kuhn and Ratzinger in the same sentence. Um, Ratzinger and Lonergan are united in upholding a strong relationship between theology and philosophy. Now that unfortunately doesn't characterise a lot of contemporary theology. Uh, the best example of that we see in Lonergan's response to Schoenenberg in um, the third collection, Christology Today. Um, and this beautiful quote from Lonergan, contemporary Catholic theology deprecates any intrusion from philosophy. The result inevitably is not no philosophy, but unconscious philosophy and only too easily bad philosophy. And it's that emphasis on, on good philosophy um, that unites Lonergan, Lonergan, Ratzinger and John Paul II. The funny, well, What's interesting, though, and what separates them is that Ratzinger is highly sceptical of the historical process of understanding. Now, it's fair enough that he rejects truth which is absolutely relativised. So Ratzinger would, would be pitted against postmodernism, for example. But, and, and look, there are reasons why Ratzinger is sceptical of history and that sort of thing. But against his harsh, um, ahistorical position, Lonergan's helpful by telling people like Ratzinger that truth and theological facts don't change, but humans change, so that their understanding of these truths change. So it's not that if he's around today, Lonergan wouldn't say Ratzinger's absolutely wrong, but if he could embrace a critical historical method, then that would advance exactly what he's trying to say. From Ratzinger to um, his, his master, and um, I, I always like to point out to Rana fans and Ratzinger fans that uh, during the Second Vatican Council, 
Um, Karl Rahner, because he's a paraderist there, he did a number of things. But one of them was he introduced his most brilliant student, a young father, Joseph Ratzinger. Now, if you want to start a fight in theology, um, get some Ratzinger fans and some Rana fans and just see what happens. Uh, the Rana people say, well, oh, no, we completely disown him and the Ratzinger fans, well, he wasn't totally corrupted by Rana. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get them to turn on me by saying, actually, I'm a Lonigan scholar. But Rana, um, he and Lonigan have common roots in, in Marshall. And I'll, I'll just throw that out as something which I, I, I think is underappreciated. Um, but they, they differed in the, the ways that they used Marshall. They were united in adopting a transcendental method um, that was transcendental in the sense of interpreting the conditions under which knowing was done. In other words, both of them, I think, inherited from Marshall the question, what are we doing when we know? Lonigan and Rana share a common term to the human subject, but I would argue that Rana's turn is perhaps more radical than Lonigan's. And we see this in, in Rana's turn away from uh, the traditional theocentric approach in, to, in theology to what's been called an anthropocentric approach. So instead of beginning with the question, what is God and how do humans fit into God's plan, Rana begins with, what is the human condition? What are human questions? And how does God answer those questions? Or how is God relevant to the human condition? Now, I'm going to throw out a value judgment here, and I'm, I'm willing to be um, criticised for it. Um, but I think sometimes Rana is too focused on the human person. Um, everything begins with the human person. Now... The advantage of that, the beauty of it, is it begins with our concerns. But just sometimes when I read Rana, I think there's too much of the human and the subject and not enough of the object in God. And that's why I think Lonigan's method, which is authentically subjective, is also better um, at being authentically subjective because Lonigan's subjectivity is always mindful of the theologian's object which is not just human beings, but God. <coughs> the way I put it with um, a Rana scholar that I was um, having a good conversation with was that um, Lonigan, in a way, and I said this the wrong way, I said Lonigan is kind of bipolar, <coughs> uh, and uh, the Rana fans all agreed with that immediately. I said, that's not what I mean. I mean that instead of operating at the one pole of the human person or the one pole of God, that Lonigan can operate with both at the same time because of his method. That's what his method allowed. That's what his emphasis on, on conversion allowed. And so, um, you know, I, I would never commit this to writing, but I said, look, what I think can really help you Rana guys is an appreciation of Lonigan, his <coughs> method and conversion. And, and that's when things got very exciting. <coughs> I want to end with the hermeneutics of suspicion. And, you know, the hermeneutics of suspicion run through um, various forms of liberation theology, be they um, race theology. Um, and if you ever... I mean, I, I, I came late to that party, but, you know, reading some of the black theology of the 1960s is very, very interesting uh, to tell you the way that theology was going at the time. There's feminist um, theology and Latin American political liberation theologies. Now, this hermeneutic of suspicion we see strongly um, in the liberation theology of Juan Segunda and the feminist theologies of Schussler uh, Fiorenza and Elizabeth Johnson. Now, I think that um, Lonigan would have a sympathy for theologies that critique ideological language. And I, I think this has been one of the really good things that these, these different hermeneutic of suspicion movements have done, is to say, look... You know, sometimes the language is ideologically loaded and we need to question that and, and critique it. But one of the problems with, with this hermeneutic of suspicion and a number of um, identity movements or issues theologies is that they are very, very good at tearing down ideologies and structures of sin 
But the question is, what replaces those, those ideologies? And my experience is that Lonigan is very amenable to what we call a hermeneutic of recovery. And I, I was introduced to that, that, that term by Hugo Menel um, almost 11 years ago. Um, and when I thought about that, I realised that what, what Lonigan does with his method is, is to give us the tools with which we can go beyond deconstruction to reconstruction and to um, advance different theologies to their higher potential. In other words, what Lonigan can do through a theology which is contemporary and traditional at the same time, a theology which um, relies on the invariant operations of the human mind, a theology which is uh, methodical and um, relies on conversion, is that Lonigan can not destroy but fulfil, to plagiarise a phrase. I think that he can do this because Lonigan's method is not tied to, as he calls it, the temporal situation or context. That is, as he said in his doctoral dissertation, he achieved, at the time he's working towards it, of course, Lodigan has a vantage point outside the temporal dialectic. He achieved a matrix or system of thought that at once is as pertinent and as indifferent to historical events as is the science of mathematics to quantitative phenomena. In other words, a method which can be involved intensely while remaining sufficiently outside <coughs> to be able to be self-critical. So certainly Lonigan has interests in contemporary concerns, but his interests go beyond that. And that's partly due to the nature of his method as a normative pattern of recurrent and related operations yielding cumulative and progressive results. In other words, Lonigan takes into account the present, but he also takes on the past and hands on to the future. And this is what I've said to a few folks from, from different theological movements. Um, you know, because I, I, I guess and now I'm going to sound like an old guy, and my kids will tell you that's the case. Uh, you know, back in the 80s when I was doing theology, um, it was all liberation theology. That was the theological orthodoxy of the time. Um, and we've been through feminist theology and eco-theology, uh, postmodern theology and, and, and these things which have great, wonderful insights. But when I feel courageous, actually when I feel, well, when I'm foolish, but I'm calling it courage, I'll ask some of my friends in this field, you're speaking so well to the present. What about the future? And, you know, I, I, I've got a very good friend in, in, in liberation theology that I once said to, what are you going to do when all the dictators have gone? And, and that, um, his, his response was great. He said, there will always be t dictators. There will always be the struggle. But the point is, Lonigan not only speaks to the past and the present, but also the future, which I think is his great strength. In other words, he's genuinely contemporary while being thoroughly traditional. So where is Lonigan situated or where is he located in contemporary theology? Now, it could be deliberately, cowardly and evasive and ask, which Catholic theology? <laughs> um, we have a remarkable variety of Catholic theologies today. Some complement one, one another. Others see theologians accused of heresy, or, as we saw last week, um, <coughs> theologians accusing the Pope of heresy. Um, yeah, that was fun. Uh, where is Lonigan really? Well, certainly not accusing the Pope of heresy. But where he is, um, the best answer comes from Lonigan himself. And not something that he wrote and predicted, but I, I, I'm more and more saying that he prophesied the future of theology. In Dimensions of Meaning, in, in the first collection, he foresaw the formation of different parties within Catholicism. There were those who'd hold on to the classicist framework, standing firm against the ravages of the modern world. Those aren't his words, but mine. While there'd be another party that would form in an attempt to embrace modernity, 
but lacked adequate methodological formations. And so he wrote this. Classical culture cannot be jettisoned without being replaced. And what replaces it cannot but run counter to classical expectations. There is bound to be formed a solid right that is determined to live in a world that no longer exists. Now, I would add to that, these are not my words, not Lonigan's. I'd say a solid right determined to live in a world that never existed. Lonigan continues, there's bound to be formed a scattered left, captivated by now this, now that new development, exploring now this and now that new possibility. And I, I, I think, and maybe we can debate this, <coughs> he predicted the state of Catholicism today. You know, we've got the solid right who, who want to live in a world that either no longer exists or never did. And then the scattered left who are on, you know, this trend, this flavour of the month and, and, and this new issue. But what would Lonigan want us to do? What Will County says is perhaps not too numerous centre, big enough to be at home in both the old and the new, painstaking enough to work out one by one the transitions to be made, strong enough to refuse half measures and insist on complete solutions even though it has to wait. So where is Lonigan located? It's there at the not too numerous centre. Neither right nor left. Neither blindly following tradition nor naively embracing contemporary trends. But faithful to tradition and concerned with the modern world. Neither committed to faith nor reason alone, but committed to reason guided by faith. He's committed to upholding the standards of modern science and scholarship, but not beholden to them because he understood the universality of human consciousness. So where is Lonigan? Neither left nor right, neither high nor low, but firmly, in all ways, in my opinion, at the centre. Thank you. Thank you.